Well, good afternoon. Very warm welcome to St. Lawrence's Church, a church which Chris and Charlotte graced with their presence. In fact, Chris held a special responsibility here for some years. And it's good to see so many here, Mark, of the respect and affection with which he was held. That There are so many here this afternoon, and you've come so far to be here. Just like to draw your attention to the fact that donations go to the Old Swinford Hospital Bursary Fund, and everyone is welcome to join the family for refreshments after this service in the church. I was also asked to say, but it may be slightly late now, that there has been a tab at the church cafe for tea, coffee and cake, but I see some of you have already availed yourselves of that opportunity. So I'm going to begin with some words of Jesus, um, and uh, these give us hope as well as comfort in the face of the loss of a loved one, give us hope for ourselves. I am the resurrection and the life, says the Lord. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. So we meet in the name of Jesus Christ, who died and was raised to the glory of God the Father. Grace and mercy be with you. We have come here today to remember before God our brother Christopher Frank Rendell Potter, known as Chris, to give thanks for his life, to commend him to God, our merciful Redeemer and Judge, and to comfort one another in our grief. So I'm just going to begin with an opening prayer, which speaks of our confidence in the face of death, but also of God's comfort to us. So let's pray. Merciful Father, hear our prayers and comfort us. Renew our trust in your Son, whom you raised from the dead. Strengthen our faith that all who have died in the love of Christ will share in his resurrection, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And so we stand to sing the first hymn that's been requested for this service, Ye Holy Angels Bright.
please be seated. We can have a number of eulogies from family and friends. Thank you. So I'm very sorry, Sophie's lost her voice, so I'm going to have to do all of it, which is good. Um, so thank you so much for coming. It means so much to everyone. So, and this is on behalf of uh, Shami and Luke, myself, um, Sophie and Kate, and see Mummy and the wider family. So um, this might, some of this you probably don't know, some of this you may do, but uh, let's, let's see. So um, uh, let me take you through a few bits about Daddy. So he was very much lar larger than life, both in spirit and stature. And to his pupils, his stature might have felt imposing, striding as he did through the school grounds in his academic gown. But to us, he was just Daddy, whose warm embrace made for the most comfortable cushion whilst relaxing in the comfort of our family homes. Rarely without a twinkle in his eye, he was the role model in the way he approached life, while he took, a great, while he took great delight in the pleasures of life he always enjoyed them um, when, when shared, never at the expense of others. He was a man at peace with himself, whatever hat he was wearing, and sometimes that hat was even a fez. <laughs> it is impossible to reflect on Daddy's life as a father without considering how we, like his many pupils, were enriched by his warm, enthusiastic and purposeful direction and support. As he did for his pupils, he nurtured and encouraged our individual talents and interests, while he rejoiced enthusiastically when aligned with his own. He also listened with an open mind when they did not. He questioned but never judged. Instead, he encouraged us to consider, were we behaving as a radiator or a drain? Did we live our lives in the way which radiated positive energy on the world around us, without doubt, he was the ultimate radiator. Daddy was always doing something and never sat still, except for a quick afternoon sleep, or ziz, as he called it, on the sofa. And apart from the essential watching of the nine o'clock news and key sporting events, he infrequently watched television simply to put his feet up. His hobbies always had purpose. And he had a tendency also that these became slightly obsessive. Now, not long before ancestry was a thing, uh, he had painstakingly researched our family history back to the Norman Conquest. And he used to bring out a great big long scroll that he would show everyone that went back to William the Conqueror. Uh, and when ancestry came along, he then went a little bit further and used to play a game with them where he got on the computer and then could also get, see how fast he could get back three centuries um, on their family at a party or two. So it was, it was um, uh, he certainly loved his, his, um, his family history. Um, the other thing which he uh, absolutely loved was book collecting. And, uh, you know, we've got a, all the King Penguins, Britain and Pictures, and that are, we, we now, as the five of us, know hey and why like the back of our hands because of it. And also why there were three books dedicated, three rooms dedicated to books in St. Leonard's next door. Um, and that sort of, those sort of hobbies and interests also expand a little bit to, uh, in later life, he was always seen on his smartphone learning Greek on Duolingo. And I think he had just completed 360, 365 day streak on the day that he died. Um, uh, the other things which, uh, you know, he, he sort of did later in life, he would always be um, with his Fitbit walking 10,000 steps a day, walking around the swimming pool in Crete, all hours of the day, in all weathers. So he had a hidden energy and passion for everything and anything. And it was really rather quite remarkable. But the one thing, or two things actually, completely mastered perfectly was the perfect toasted crumpet to butter ratio and the recipe for devil kidneys. So it was only natural that Daddy utilised his long home skills as an experienced educator to manage our lively household as smoothly, as calmly as possible. As an effective school leader, he understood 
that maintaining the appearance of control was just as important as holding it. At the beginning of each school holiday, he meticulously timetabled a rotor of chores for all of us to compete, complete for the duration of the break, mimicking the implementation of a timetable at the beginning of the new school term. What should have resulted in several weeks of order and clean dishes actually resulted in weeks of duty swaps with negotiations regarding the perceived level uh, each chore demanded, demanded. Unloading the dishwasher could not be simply swapped for hand washing the pans. While negotiations could often escalate to heated conferences, we understood that it was up to us to fulfill the responsibility given to us one way or another, and as a result, the washing was always done. Uh, we also had, uh, if you, as many of you know, we had a, 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 at some point a, com a, a massive collection of pets of all varieties. So I think we once had eight cats, two fish tanks, a dog. And it was remarkable that not only transporting five children and associated bits and bobs from Stourbridge to Herefordshire most weekends and all you know, school holidays, I think adding all those animals onto that was a logistical triumph of military standards. Um, and it always seemed to happen, and it was amazing. Amazing credit, actually, to both Mummy and Daddy for, for how that actually happened. But uh, the, other, the, other, the other story about um, cats was he, he, would only, he would always want to name them. So when we were on a holiday to Wales, he said, no more cats unless, they were na unless he can name them. So along came Ajax, Achilles, and Hector. Um, so another story about pets was uh, when Tufnell escaped. I don't know if you remember the golden retriever Tufnell. Uh, who would always love to escape. Now, he won, one day, he um, uh, happens to escape from Headmaster's House in Old um, during a first 15 rugby game. Um, and Tufnell escaped. We chased after him. Daddy was watching the rugby, as he always did, on the sidelines with the parents. Uh, Tufnell um, ran onto the pitch. The, the fullback, just at that time, was closing near the, um, the try line looked out for support beyond him because he wasn't going to quite get there, and there was Tufnell on the overlap. Um, but unfortunately, <laughs> with the headmaster and us trying to do a pincer movement around him, but Daddy never really quite let these things, um, sort of uh, pandemonium, ever dim diminish his sense of authority, and he always sort of seemed to brush off these mishaps. Um, and it was always made, it always then made for a good story. Um, so, so continue on. I think the other the other thing we've got to think about is that in in we f between the five of us, when Charmian turned 13 in 1986, and the twins tw um, when they became 20 in uh, 2003, so that's 17 years of being of te looking after teenagers. It's quite an interesting um, thing. So he always tried to get us out of bed in interesting ways in the morning. So it started off with him playing opera at full blast at nine o'clock in the morning, so they were from his latest recording that he, he would do. But then he realized this might not be a good idea because he didn't want us to dislike classic, classical music in the future. So he then moved to slightly different, different techniques. So what it changed to, is, particularly in St. Leonard's, was to put in 30 sauce, Ludlow sausages into the agra and let the smell generally waft up the house and then we would all come down you know and increasingly more hungover uh, that, that we would then get out of bed on time and then the day could begin um, the other thing which he loved to do was he would he laid down a lot of very good wine in the 1980s that would mature when we were all in our 20s uh, and he, a message would go down to london that he was opening a bottle of something very, very nice, and then suddenly we would come up with all our friends and etc. and the house would be full. Because that was Daddy, he wanted to have a big do. It was what he called it, a do, sort of party. Uh, I want a nice do, he would always say. Uh, and these do's would always finish with a bottle, a bottle of port or two, um, always pass three times round, um, like Trinity College Cambridge, at which point the story would come out again. Um, and um, Sometimes this got sort of even uh, more sort of um, riotous, and uh, one of which actually ended up with him leading a conga into the church inn, uh, which is the pub there from the house there, uh, late at night. So 
I think this sort of sense of hospitality um, was really quite remarkable. Um, and I've sort of vaguely lost my, my train of thought here. Um, <laughs> but I think, you know, I think food, drink, and getting everyone together was what he absolutely lived for. And that's where we sort of absolutely remember him, and particularly for the stories that he, um, he would bring out of those. So um, but I think that's sort of where we sort of come to. And possibly let's leave, us, leave it with his favourite story, which is one that we can probably repeat here. Um, and this is the story which is how he met Mummy. So um, we've got to do a nice daddy story. So um, uh, obviously she, it was 1970, um, and uh, Mummy was over with Auntie Sue, who's somewhere here, uh, up in Edinburgh for a year abroad. And um, she didn't go home because it was very expensive to fly back in those days. So. Um, uh, she, Sue offered her to come down to Cambridgeshire to go and stay with um, uh, her family. Uh, and obviously she, um, well, back in those days we didn't have mobile phones or particularly good ways of communication. So the only thing which, well, my father had a junior schoolmaster with a sports car, so he had the skills necessary to pick up um, this friend from Edinburgh. So, uh, but... He, so he went off, he didn't know the, he knew the day, he didn't know the time, which train, um, uh, only that it was an American called Charlotte Millis. So he went to the first train that could possibly get from Edinburgh and then started asking every woman who got off the train, are you Charlotte Millis, are you Charlotte Millis, are you Charlotte At one point the, uh, the station master actually had to come over and say, excuse me, why are you sort of going up to all the... <laughs> but eventually on the last train from Edinburgh, possible train, on the last carriage and the last person it was, happened to be Charlotte Millis. So. Uh, and, and the rest, I think, is history, which he never really, he had good stories and then he left, he left a bit of mystery after that sort of carry on. But I think um, all these stories were amazing and, we, and we're privileged to have, have heard them throughout you know, and so many of these. And they always told them with, with such brilliance. So I think... What's lovely is also is that they're now being passed down to his, you know, to his grandchildren, um, many of whom are, are here today. Um, but I think his impact on all of us has been um, absolutely amazing. We we miss him dearly, and I think at you know at Christmas, you know, it, we particularly saw it when all our glasses were empty and we were just looking around saying, "Ooh." This is, uh, uh, you know, the little things that you, you think about just don't happen anymore. So, anyway, thank you very much. My name is uh, Jake Murray. I'm Charmian Murray, uh, Charmian's husband. I'm reading uh, this ode to, uh, by Horace uh, instead of Freya, Freya, who can't be here today. Um, Charmian wanted me to say that um, she and Chris were both members of the Horatian Society in, in London, I believe. Uh, he made her a member, uh, and they had many, many wonderful meals there. Um, so this is Horace Odes 214, Ehu Fugakes Posthume Posthume in a version by Charmian, um, inspired by Chris's favourite uh, Horatian poem. O oh, child and grandchild, how quickly the years slip fast away from us. The call of family and pursuit of community, combined with duty, do not slow down the wrinkles nor the knocking of old age and death indomitable. Even if you tried to placate the tearless Pluto, my friend, with 300 bulls a day, you would not stop the inevitable. He is a god who chains both the triple-headed beast Geryon and the giant Titios in his melancholy waters. We must all one day cross that fiery river, having pastured upon the fruits of the earth, whether we are rich or poor. 
There is no escape from the bloody hands of war, nor the roaring crash of waves on our shore. There is no escape from the fear of the autumnal breeze that takes the breath from our health, capturing our bodies' seas. There is no escape from the sight of black Coquitos coiling in its icy underworld freeze, and the notorious family of Danaeus and Sisyphus, son of Aeolus, condemned to hard labour. All things must be left behind, earth and home, safety and a much-loved wife, and none of the trees you carefully tend, except the troublesome cypress, which seems to shadow our transient existence, echoing our mortality. You are my legacy, more deserving than me. Please drink deep the Cucuban wine, stored up behind lock and key, and paint the pavements red with its magnificent, unmixed truth. Love, as potent and lasting as a holy banquet. Thank you. Old Swinford Hospital School had been educating boys for more than 300 years, but by 1978, it was down at heel. The buildings called out for refurbishment, numerous staff warranted retirement, enlivening or replacement, and us pupils needed a good role model, aspirations and beliefs. For all its years, the school had few traditions and could boast only moderate academic success. Then arrived Mr. C. F. R. Potter, M.A. Cantab, our new headmaster. With city style suits, an academic gown, a silver lapel watch chain, and the grey overcoat, certain standards came quickly to be expected. Dawn visits and bedside chats revealed a genuine interest in each and every border, and respect soon followed. And it rose enormously once we adolescent boys saw and met Charlotte, his Californian wife. You can read elsewhere about the headmaster's achievements with the powers that once were and how he saved Old Swinford from imminent closure. Our sagging iron-framed beds were replaced by box beds with flat mattresses. Dorms were given carpets and curtains, and to encourage study, we were given carols, bedside workstations for evening prep, with masters reminding us regularly that carols were not just for Christmas. And rat-catching became a forgotten art. During the previous three centuries, only three main boarding houses had been developed. Somehow, the headmaster secured DFF funding, and with Fefe's support, four new boarding houses were built, as well as squash courts, new classrooms, new laboratories, a new dining hall, and later, a large sports hall. That much of the fabric of the school today was developed under his stewardship remains an outstanding achievement, properly acknowledged by the only new boarding house since his retirement being named Potter House. Now, I cannot say whether he desired recognition for these material matters, but when the Victorian swimming baths were levelled, we boys noticed that the outlines of the replacing lawns and foliage suspiciously resembled the initials CP. <laughs> now, people say a headmaster sets the culture of a school, and C.F.R. Potter certainly did that. He stopped fagging, he stopped sadistic punishments, and he quietly neutered the excesses of sixth form studies. He made a point of knowing all boys by name. He knew the names and the particulars of many parents as well. Forward-looking, he was one of the first heads to introduce computers into classrooms. 
Indeed, years later, he would build his own. And he introduced what old Swinford lacked, what aspirational parents expected, and what boys unknowingly wanted, traditions to bind them together. And by Jove, he loved his new traditions. In came cooked breakfast meetings for the masters and enough annual house Christmas dinners to put even the headmaster off Turkey. In came Adventure Week with its varied and sometimes precarious and ambitious activities. Some school-based, some national, some foreign. In came business suits for six formers. For prefects, there were red ties and blue gowns. Excellent work began to be recognised, with boys reporting to the headmaster, for once not to be caned, but with exercise books for discussions about their efforts and sometimes a fibre from his own pocket. And the school started to have scholars, and in recognition, a scholar's feast, sometimes even with a boy's own guest speaker, like a pilot shot down in one of the more recent wars. Of course, not all new traditions took off. After the headmaster faced a particularly, first, a particularly quick first-team bowler, any notion of an annual Masters Boys cricket match seemed to fade away. <laughs> to improve academic standards, some Masters were moved on, others redeployed, and un younger, energetic ones, able to explain, were recruited. And the headmaster needed to recruit, and to recruit well. He looked the part, was always bright-eyed, and every year he had at least one new major project to entice. Very much what the world of marketing lost, Old Swinford gained. While he started with a poor product, he had enthusiastic, if naive, sales force. We boys would be set to work giving parents tours of the school, but only of the new or refurbished parts. Other parts were well off bounds. He would charm mothers into thinking that her little boy would thrive at Old Swinford, while reassuring fathers that the fees were modest or could be managed. He introduced and taught archaeology, and by all accounts was a very fine teacher, perhaps because he cared. Boys who performed less well in other subjects performed well in archaeology, and some choose to make it areas for their work. Within five years, the school got its first ever boy into Oxbridge. Given the school did not prepare boys for exams, and the target was his old alma mater, Trinity College, Cambridge, and given the patent inadequacies of the pupil concerned, it is now obvious that the headmaster's own degree in classics with its peddling of fantastical myths, must have played a very sizable part in the reference and the result. More importantly, the headmaster's achievements helped other boys to believe they could also succeed. And for many years thereafter, the school sent one or more boys to Oxford or Cambridge. An academic tradition long miss missing was born. Arguably the pinnacle of the headmaster's achievements was Old Swinford Hospital coming top of the National League table for GCSEs. When he retired, the number of boarders had risen many-fold and the school was oversubscribed. But even as he approached retirement, he did not slacken. With characteristic foresight, in a presentation to the Fefes and governing body, he advocated the then heresy of admitting girls throughout the school. Since his death, many boys have spoken of how Mr. Potter helped them in ways they had never previously revealed. Some mentioned how he had arranged lessons elsewhere for subjects the school did not teach, how he had recommended a particular university or course, and how the same had opened unknown doors and careers, how one cricket captain had learned something of the art of negotiation in team selection with him. Many have spoken of the expectations and standards he demanded in both dress and manners and how they came to appreciate and adopt both in their lives. Others have simply spoken of a man who made time for them, 
who guided them and gave them confidence and belief, enabling them to enjoy their lives. There are hundreds of old folians out there whose lives and those of their families have been improved by Mr Potter. I end by borrowing from the school's motto, Vinci Malum Bonu. Rather than being overawed by the evils he inherited, Chris Potter overcame them with immeasurable good. There's something about headmasters which I've always found unnerving. It comes from personal experience. At primary school, there was Mr Baldwin, who came from that tradition of thinking that the best way to a disruptive boy's brain was by the application of a ruler to the palm of his hand in front of class. It was, of course, just a tap, but the shame was painful. And then there was the headmaster at my grammar school, who always processed around the corridors with gown billowing and mortarboard never worn but perched on the tip of his fingers. He never actually spoke to us boys, but rather addressed us from a position of superiority. His name was Dr. Witt, though being the scallywags that we were, we were inclined to put a T in front of his name. Chris Potter came from a quite different mould. A man for tradition, certainly, but here was a headmaster, well, a retired one by the time I met him, who clearly enjoyed meeting and engaging with people, young and not so young, and whatever the circumstances. I first met Chris and Charlotte when we moved to Ludlow almost 15 years ago and started attending services here at St Lawrence's. Chris was amongst the first to welcome us, and it wasn't long before that welcome extended to meals at each other's homes. A memorable occasion was a Thanksgiving meal, presumably a tradition introduced by Charlotte into the Potter household. Towards the end of the meal, and never one to be stingy with his hospitality, Chris produced not one, not two, but three decanters of different ports. After describing the vintage of each, he asked which I would like. Well, there's the challenge. But I think I must have chosen wisely, because that seemed to seal the friendship. His care and interest in people showed in many ways. A long-standing Rotarian, he transferred his membership from the Stourbridge Club to the club here when he and Charlotte moved to Ludlow. And it was through my own Rotary membership that I was able to see for myself his commitment to the local community. It was, though, through his deep interest in all things historical that his concern for others really shone through here. As chairman of the historical research group and through the many hours he spent at the records office in Hereford and Shrewsbury, his reputation for helping others, particularly in their genealogical researches, became great known and really valued. Yet for me at least, Chris's love for people and generosity and friendship is best illustrated by his 80th birthday celebrations in Crete. We hadn't planned to go, but it was Chris's insistence that we should join the party that won us over. And what a lunch party it was. There were, I guess, at least 50 of us sat at tables in a village square high in the Cretan hills, next, of course, to Chris's favorite taverna. There, we literally tore into platters of spit-roasted lamb, helped down by endless jugs of Cretan wine. Two things were remarkable about the gathering. The first was the wide cross-section of people who were there. Relations and old friends, of course, but also the local plumber and Charlotte's hairdresser and others who Chris had come to meet and befriend during their time there. Chris had a tremendous ability to turn acquaintances quickly into friends. The second was Chris's enthusiasm for traditional Greek dance, which became apparent when the Greek dancers arrived to entertain us. This had been an aspect of Chris's devotion to all things Greek, which had somehow eluded me. But in encouraging us to join in, 
I suspect few of us will forget the sheer energy and vigour of Chris's demonstration of how to do it. So much so that we were worried that he might just lose his trousers in the process. I have no doubt that at the heart of Chris's being was a deep faith. It was a faith which was expressed by his time as church warden here at St. Lawrence's between 2004 and 2007. It was a faith that continued to be lived out in Crete, where he and Charlotte supported the services at St. Thomas's Anglican Church, accompanied, of course, by Harry, their dog. And it was a faith which was reflected in his relationships with all he met. I think Chris would think it a bit quaint to be told that there was a theological basis for the way he lived his life. But I have no doubt that there was. It was about accepting responsibility for one's actions under God, for pointing others to him, yet letting people be free to be themselves and to make their own decisions. It was a rule of life which governed all he met and all he did, both professionally and personally. It was certainly reflected in his deep affection for Charlotte, where their mutual support and understanding, and yes, love, was palpable. And it was reflected in a father's pride and respect for his children, so much so that he would regularly keep us updated for what they were all doing. Charmian, Sophie, Luke, Marcus, Katie, do know and remember that your father loved you and all those close to you very, very deeply. So, Chris, for your acts of kindness and generosity, for your sense of duty and service, for your care for family and friends, and for your faith, may you rest in peace and rise in glory. Well, thank you very much for all those tributes, obviously a remarkable man, and as we finished on the note of Chris's faith, we stand to sing the hymn, Dear Lord and Father of Mankind.
So please be seated for our reading. This is Jesus speaking from John chapter 14. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I am going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Well, for three to four years, Chris was church warden here at this church of St. Lawrence's. Uh, the position of church warden is a very ancient one, going back to the 14th century. So he had responsibility for this building, for the finances, for the conduct of worship, and many other things. This church has been called the Cathedral of South Shropshire. It's the largest church in Shropshire in the Hereford Diocese. So it has a very significant and demanding role. I haven't heard yet whether he actually did all 201 steps up to the top of the tower, but I expect as such a conscientious person that he did. He didn't, he didn't, oh right. <laughs> one, one thing he didn't manage to do, he did, obviously did so many other things. Anyway, Charlotte also was deputy warden here, and I know your church warden at, uh, out in Crete. As we heard from Barry, a man of strong faith, we've seen the outworkings of that faith in many of the stories that have been told. And I'm told he was a great help to the rector of the time here. Someone else has told me that, incidentally, he was Ian Hislop's tutor at Harding Life School. And uh, I found that interesting, actually, because some boys used to come from Arden High School on some summer activities that I was involved with, and I know there was a spiritual revival in that period of time, and I know that Ian Hislop has had a positive attitude to the Christian faith uh, over the years. So a man of considerable gifts, Chris used them to play a very significant part, obviously, in the role of this church here, in the preservation of St. Lawrence's, its Christian witness, which actually goes back to Saxon times, this church being rebuilt in the 12th century. He had witnessed, well, the, the, the church has witnessed many historical events through all those centuries, as he's borne witness to the fact that Prince Arthur's heart is buried here and all sorts of other associations. In Christ's day, no doubt, there would have been the civic services, big service for Remembrance Sunday, the installation of the mayor, the service for the judges and the legal profession, schools coming in here, and so many other important civic events. Plus all the organ recitals, concerts, flower shows, art exhibitions, lectures, and so on. A place of Christian witness at the centre of this town. And so this church commemorating St. Lawrence, a Christian martyr who had a heart for the poor. I'm sure Chris, with his interest in archaeology and history, would have uh, absorbed and helped to preserve that sense of historical continuity in this church. Which brings me to Jesus' own words to his followers in the face of his own death. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. We've obviously just celebrated Easter in this parish, celebrated how Jesus died on the cross, the righteous for the unrighteous, the innocent for the guilty, because we've all fallen short of God's perfect standards. So he paid the penalty for our sin, so there's no penalty for us to pay, but by availing ourselves of that, we can have a relationship with God now, the reality of which is an inner guarantee of the fullness of that relationship when either we die or Jesus comes again. And then on Easter Sunday, we celebrated Jesus conquering death, rising from the dead, 
I was actually a law student at what people at Cambridge, like Chris, would have called the other place. <laughs> Though I noticed he spent a year in sabbatical at Christchurch, Oxford, which called itself the house. The college that I was at was next door. They disparagingly called my college the garage, but there you are. Anyway, I was a law student, and I was given a book, because I wasn't brought up to go to church, looking at the evidence for Jesus rising from the dead. And I have to say, as a law student, looking at it with an open mind, I came to the conclusion that Jesus must have risen from the dead. He was therefore alive today and could be known in a personal way. And so this is our confidence in the face of death for Chris, for ourselves, that by faith in him, we can be confident that Jesus has gone before us to prepare a place for us. Indeed, he's gone to prepare the way because he said he is the way and he is the truth. He keeps his promises and he is the life, a life which he offers to us now and experience of which is a guarantee, a token of the fullness of life to come. So in the midst of loss, the sadness of the passing, knowing that we do miss him very much, we can have hope. I am the resurrection and the life said Jesus. Anyone who believes in me, even though he die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Well, with that, we come to our prayer. So if you'd like to be in an attitude of prayer, I'm going to say three prayers. Firstly, a prayer thanking God for the memory of Chris. Father in heaven, we thank you because you made us in your own image and gave us gifts in mind, body and spirit. We thank you now for Chris Potter and what he meant to each of us. We thank you for what he meant to us as husband, father, grandfather, relative and friend. And we give thanks especially for his love of his family his enthusiasm for the classics, archaeology, genealogy, and all things Greek. And we also give thanks especially for his enthusiasm for teaching and the guidance he gave to so many boys to enable them to become fine young men. So I'm just going to leave a pause for us to bring our own memories of Chris before God. So as we honour his memory, make us more aware that you are the one from whom comes every perfect gift, including the gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ. Amen. And then thinking of Charlotte and all the family especially, we pray for those who mourn. Almighty God, Father of all mercies and giver of all comfort, deal graciously, we pray, with those who mourn that, casting all their care on you, they may know the consolation of your love through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And then a prayer about the way that we live, that we may live in the light of eternity. Grant us, Lord, the wisdom and the grace to use aright the time that is left to us here on earth. Lead us to repent of our sins, the evil we have done, and the good we have not done, and strengthen us to follow the steps of your Son in the way that leads to the fullness of eternal life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And I invite you to join with me in saying the version of the Lord's Prayer printed on the card. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
So now we stand to sing a great resurrection hymn, Thine Be the Glory. standing for our final prayers. Support us, O Lord, all the day long of this troublous life until the shadows lengthen and the evening comes, the busy world is hushed, the fever of life is over, and our work is done. Then, Lord, in your mercy, grant us a safe lodging, a holy rest, and peace at the last. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And now may God in his infinite love and mercy bring the whole church living and departed in the Lord Jesus to a joyful resurrection and the fulfilment of his eternal kingdom. Amen. And a final sentence from scripture. Now unto him that is able to keep us from falling and to present us faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to the only wise God our Saviour be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. So if you'd like to remain standing and the, the music will be played, I'd like to follow up the near relatives as we go to the back. Thank you.